Hey there, fellow endurance athletes. It's Debbie and I'm recording from my sauna <laughs> slash office slash glass house up here on our hilltop upper yard. So if you're watching the video, you might see me suddenly sweating because it's super hot here today. It's September 1st as I record this and it's a little heat wave in San Diego for the next week. So I am in my glass house with the windows open and it's still hot. So anyways. I'm here to finally chat with Bill Schneidler. I've met him at a few conferences and really love to talk to people that are following their passion and their purpose and finding what their why is to figure that mission out. And we're going to talk about ancestral health, ancestral food planning. And as I learned as a nutritional therapy practitioner, it's not, I never like to say low carb, keto, paleo you know, give you a name to how you're eating. I believe we should eat nutrient dense whole foods that balance our blood sugar and avoid spiking up your glucose more than say 30. If you're measuring your glucose with the CGM or Ketomojo blood test. Now we are the low carb athlete podcast, which means endurance athletes should be being able to burn fat, oxidized fat at a higher level so they can go longer in their events and their training, their workout. So if you're training for an Ironman that I did for many, many years, 50 K trail runs, ultra running marathons, half marathon, you're going to be burning a little more glucose and carbs. If you're racing, we need to improve that metabolic efficiency so we can go train or race at a higher heart rate and be burning oxidizing more fat for fuel so we can spare the glycogen stores. So you'll listen to my many amazing podcasts out lately with people as Jay Feldman talking about energy metabolism. You still need to metabolize carbohydrates and fat. It's more the why what's not working in your body if you can't tolerate carbs. But what I keep trying to clarify in every episode almost is it's not it's eating real food. We all say that we all agree on finding the right macronutrient ratio of real food sources, getting rid of the garbage, not the bad, you know, getting rid of the processed bad carbohydrates, not thinking that all carbs are evil as Rob Wolf will talk about earlier this year. So carbohydrates, we have to reframe what that means in a clean eating real food plan for athletes are those berries and eating by the season ancestral health. And even Mike Mutzel is saying this and Paul Saladino, it's eating foods where you live. Like if it's in Costa Rica or Hawaii, or I'm in San Diego, what foods are in season eating by the season is what you want to do and finding that right balance. If you listen to NutriSense Cara Collier about how we want to balance up blood sugar by pairing a fruit or a safe start with a protein and a fat and really prioritizing your fats, 30 to 50 grams of protein, sorry, not fat, 30 to 50 grams of protein per meal and spreading that out throughout the day, especially as an athlete, especially as an aging athlete, and especially more important for the female athlete that's pre post menopause. We want to get more protein and build more muscle And that means lifting heavier weights and not doing like the 15, 20 rep workout and not think that your cardio workout is going to help build muscle. We want more strength training and shorter intensity intervals, a couple days a week, and then your long, slow aerobic engine development workout. So with food, we want to pair our nutrition with our exercise. So matching the workout output, the energy output that day with what you're eating. So it's all about eating real food and if it involves carbs are real food, nature sources of carbohydrates. So don't think that means, oh, we're going to eat chips, popcorn, muffins, all the processed foods. No one's saying that we're saying get rid of the processed foods and the vegetable oil. So Jay Feldman has some great information in his podcast on my interview. And with Brad Kearns, he did a bunch of in-depth conversation with Brad and Brad's kind of changing his way, eating more fruit first thing in the morning. Everyone's different. There's not one size fits all approach. When I'm working with my clients to create a personalized nutrition and exercise plan, 
I'm looking at their GI map. I'm looking at their Dutch test. I'm looking at their food sensitivities, their heart rate variability, their glucose ketones, looking at all this data because you are a unique individual, your stress will impact everything. So if you are chronically stressed or wake up with anxiety, your glucose is going to be higher and you're not going to be able to burn fat. So we have to look at you, the unique individual, when we're talking about how to burn fat, how to improve performance and how to improve the aging process, longevity. So Bill today will talk to us about real food, looking at what our ancestors ate, and then I'll try to bring that together with how does this work for the endurance athletes? So I just want to share that because I know I had someone ask a question, um, comment on Jay Feldman's podcast out. And, you know, it's funny, we are the low carb athlete podcast, but that does not mean zero carbs It's about carb timing. And when do we need them? It depends if we're doing a higher intensity workout program and where to place those carbs in between a two day workout. As I did track workout the other night, a Tuesday night, and I did a hard swim workout at noon. It depends on the placement of the workouts that day, making sure you have recovery two days in between a hard workout. As you're older, you might need more than one day rest, active recovery, low intensity workout. And then some people do better saving all their carbs for more evening refeed. And then some people that aren't exercising can just do with one day a week refeed and be burning carbs that day. So we need carb metabolism and fat metabolism. So if you struggle with carbs, it might be more than just what you're eating. It could be stress. It could be poor digestion, microbiome imbalances, yeast overgrowth. Your microbiome could be craving more carbs and having you feed them. So you don't do well with them because you're just increasing that dysbiosis. So there's so much to dive into to figure out what is best for you. And that's what I do not to sell my coaching, but, you know, finding a coach is myself. That's going to help you figure out what's all this information mean and how to dive in deeper to figure out what is the best way to eat, to train, how to fuel for those workouts and how to recover faster and how to improve sleep and stress and all that. So let's bring on bill. He's just coming on the waiting room here and enjoy the show. Let me know your questions on the YouTube channel, low carb athlete or Instagram, the low carb athlete. All right, guys, I've got eat like a human master expert, Bill Schneidler to talk about nutrient dense foods and how we can eat to burn fat, to improve performance, improve the aging process as an athlete. So I have run into him at many conferences here everywhere. And I'm happy to have you on the show to talk about your story and your, your why your purpose, your mission, what's going on. So thanks Bill for coming on, on a awesome. hot day out here in San Diego. Well, it's not as hot here, but I am, I'm here in Maryland. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. And I'm glad we finally get a chance to talk on, uh, on a, on a zoom and I uh, hope I, have something important to share with your audience. You always do. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, I was just saying to Bill that we, you know, we're endurance athletes, but I think people are just are cons- that listen are, you know, we're 40 and older, we're aging up and we want to improve, as I say, every episode, what you're doing now and improve your future self. Like my parents are 80. I just lost my dad a couple months ago. And I just feel like there's so much we can do to take ownership of our health now in our forties and fifties to set ourselves up for success as an older adult and not blame the aging process, but embrace the aging process and Mm -hmm. really just take ownership now of all these things we can do, starting with proper nutrition. That's so important. Absolutely. And I did a, I did a talk, oh, about six or seven months ago at at a local venue. And and it was mostly, uh, everybody there is retired and and most of the people in the audience were um, well beyond retirement age. And we were talking about the same kind of things we're going to talk about, obviously, here today, and you talk about uh, regularly. And at the end of it, I I could tell I was losing some of the people. Some people were drifting off a little bit. And at the end, somebody asked a question. I said, yeah, but I I get all this. But oops, that was my alarm to get ready to talk with you a little bit early. Um, So they said, well, yeah, I get all this. This makes sense. But we're not 25. Like, 
should we, does it even make a difference now? Should we, should we even start to do any of these things now? I'm 70, you know, 75 years old. And I, I the, the general consensus in the room, what they thought was, no, it's too late to do anything about mm. um, any of the <laughs> damage that were, was caused over the first seven years of their life. And the answer was absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Um, yeah. A big part of that conversation was about plant toxins, um, which uh, obviously that you can turn some of that stuff around in, in a matter of weeks or months, or at least begin to. But uh, yeah, I am 49 years old. I was a division one athlete. Uh, I wrestled for Ohio State, one of the best wrestling programs in the country in the 90s. It still is today. And I'm 49 years old now, and I am living my best life and have uh, enjoying my uh, the best health I ever had in my entire life now. And I uh, certainly hope that continues. And I attribute all of that to um, taking lessons from the past and applying ancestral approaches to food and to mine and my family's diets, you know, currently well, today. I, I turned 50 last November, almost a year now. Jeez, I keep saying just turned 50, but I'm... Uh, I was saying as I turned 50 that I'm striving to live my best life the second half of my life. Like yeah. the first 50 years are just kind of learning and exploring and figuring out life and making mistakes and growing from that. Now it's like, all right, now I've got it. I know what to do. I'm continue on and game on. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's such a great goal. So at the, so on one, in one sort of side, I'd like, no matter what age you are, certainly the different the changes that you make, especially from a dietary perspective, um, are, are important to do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, at the same time, the foundation that you're laying is so incredibly important, like you said. So I, I caused myself unknowingly listening to the FDA and doctors and nutritionists and everybody I was supposed to be listening to caused a lot of damage and a lot of harm to my body for the first, I would say, 35 years of my life. Um, but laying the foundation now for the second half of our lives is really, really important. Certainly. So let's kind of, I will re put stuff in the intro, but what is your, why, like, what's your, what drives you to do all this that you do? Well, it's gone through stages. What, what drove me for a long part of my life. Uh, and, and you've heard I know, some of the story, but I, mo I'm, like I said, I'm 49 years old for the first 35 years of my life or, or, or a little, about 35 years. I have had an incredibly changing but unhealthy relationship with food and that unhealthy relationship changed in a lot of different ways so i was heavy as a kid quite heavy in certain certain periods of my life uh, when i was younger and food at the time was something that i didn't you know that I, I didn't look at it and say oh my gosh this is food is nourishing food was something i knew i needed food was something i craved but food was something that I knew when I put it into my body, it was making me look and, 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 and uh, a certain way, it made other kids make fun of me, made me feel bad in my own skin, all of those sorts of things. And it was just, uh, and I'm sure some, uh, a feeling that many people listening can probably connect to at some point in their life. And then when I got to high school, I found sports. And even though I still hadn't changed much about my diet, I was working out really hard, three, three, even in high school, three times a day. I fell in love with wrestling. I loved wrestling. Um, I got recruited to wrestle at Ohio State. I wrestled at both Ohio State and the College of New Jersey, um, top division one and division three programs. And I, my body shape changed. I, I took on the form of an athlete. I looked like an athlete. Um, and I like, even though I performed really well, I like to say it was despite the food I was eating, not as a result of it. And I was always battling the way that I felt. I was always battling weight, but food went in my mind, my, you know, the way I viewed my relationship with food, food wasn't something now that made me heavier, made me uglier, made other kids make fun of me. Food was something that I was scared of. You know, food was something that caused me to miss weight. Um, and I was, you know, I was losing about 28 pounds in a day and a half every single week in college, um, you know, to cut weight, to make wrestling wow. incredibly unhealthy as well. And then really the, the low point came when I stopped, when I was no longer a college athlete, still eating the same diet, um, all that weight just poured on. And here I was in my twenties and this weight just poured on along with all sorts of other issues that were really at a low level for a large part of my life, but you know, all, all sorts of metabolic disease I had, um, my guts were, were, were completely messed up. You know, going to the bathroom was something that we probably shouldn't talk about now, but something I'm sure people can, 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 can relate talk about to. it all the time as a practitioner. It's, it's yeah. Funny. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, <laughs> it, uh, I rest this leg. I, I couldn't sleep. I yeah. felt I was always ill. I mean, all those things that we all know, all of it was there present in my life the entire time. My quality of life 
as a result of my food was incredibly poor, incredibly low. Every, you know, I had, I had an incredible wife and we were starting a family. All that was going very, very well. My health and, and my quality of life as a result of it was, was very poor. So this entire time, um, what drove me to answer your question more specifically, what drove me, what, what got me excited, what, you know, I spent a lot of mental energy was trying to answer this question, what I should eat. I was convinced. I remember sitting, and I know this might be too much information, but I think we need to share the, the, the important um, things that are hard to share to make a difference. I remember as a teenager, um, I think I maybe just got out of the shower or something. I, I didn't, I know I didn't have a shirt on and I was sitting on the toilet going to the bathroom. And I remember looking down at myself and you, you know, looking down on your own body yeah. <laughs> is worse than anything else. And I'm looking down at myself and looking at my stomach hanging over. And I remember grabbing the fat on my stomach and looking at it and thinking to myself, if so, like almost in tears, if somebody could just tell me what to eat, my life would be better. Like everything. And I, I know how naive that is now, but at the time, just tell me what I should eat. I'll do it. I'll lose the weight. I'll look good. And everything about my life will fall into place. And there's so many things wrong with all of that, but that's my, it was my mindset for many, many years. So um, when I started to have a family, things began to change. So instead of driving, asking what I should eat to change myself, now I was responsible for other people. I was responsible for cooking and I do the cooking yeah. in the house. So I was responsible for cooking for my wife. I was responsible for cooking for three young kids. How do I make sure that they don't experience the same things that the problems trauma that I did and I uh it became really really important then so it was about feeding my family and what's really cool is at the same time you know I have a PhD in archaeology I'm an archaeologist and anthropologist more recently been trained as a chef all of that came together when I realized the importance of understanding um, an ancestral approach to food and I had already in my toolkit the answers to the questions I should be asking. And the most important thing that transformed at that time, in addition to putting everything together, was that I realized that I was asking the wrong question my whole life. And the question that I was asking what I should be eating is the question that almost everybody in the nutrition world or anybody wanting to improve their health asks, what should I eat? You know, it's a simple question. We spend all sorts of time and mental energy and money and all the trying to answer that question. And it is important. But the thing about humans that's different about every other animal on the planet is that we eat diets that we are not biologically designed to consume. And it's the long, uh, hopefully we can get into some of this, but yeah. the reality is we have incredibly inefficient digestive tract and we eat food, we rely on foods that we have no business eating. And the way that we do that is because we have for a long time created technologies to make those foods as safe and nourishing as possible. And if that's the case, then the question we should be spending a lot of time on is how I should be eating. Yeah. For instance, um, you know, you, a lot of times I get asked, and I'm sure you do too, should we eat, you know, should humans eat bread? Should human adults drink dairy or yeah. consume dairy or, you know, those sorts of things. And those questions are not answerable unless you dive deep into the half, because a loaf of Wonder Bread and a loaf of sourdough bread are made differently. And we can answer that question differently for both of them. Uh, you know, ultra pasteurized skim milk is a completely different food than, you know, raw milk kefir that's been fully fermented from a, you know, a pastured cow, completely different foods that we give the same name to. So mm -hmm. when I started to dive deep into that, it transformed the way I ate, it transformed the way I fed my family. And so that drove me for a very long time. I achieved the best health of my life. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that I nourish my family in the best way possible. And now what drives me is I think the message is powerful enough that I just want to share it as widely as possible. So now it's more about feeding the community and nourishing the community. And that's so important. I think, you know, you just talking about how to prepare food for your family and kids. And I think that's just a huge area for more and more people to focus on sharing because I have clients and they like, you don't need to make your kids a separate meal, teach them <laughs> from a young age that this is real food. This is what we're eating. You're not going to get Mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and mom's going to eat this or dad, mom and dad are going to have this meal. It's like, why, why are we training kids from you know, toddler age on, and I don't have kids, so I can't, <laughs> you know, it's probably different when you're in that, but it's amazing how it starts, I think as a child and how your relationships with food start so early on that. Why don't we help pass on the information you're sharing, like ancestral eating and how our body's designed to eat, to digest food and how to get energy and feel your best and live your best life every day at five years old. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Why don't we work Absolutely. on that part with the parents and not have two different menu plans for the kid menu and the adult menu? 
Well, you know, th there's a woman in, Col in Boulder, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, she's amazing. She runs the, the school lunch program for the entire school district. Mm -hmm. And she is able, she literally makes from scratch her team, all the food for the public schools in Boulder, Colorado. And, and I, I didn't believe it. Like I, I heard about this woman and I heard what she was doing. I'm like, this is impossible. So I went, I went with my youngest daughter and my wife and we went to visit my wife, Christina. And we went to visit her to, to see the operation and how she actually pulls this off. And also to try the food to see if it was any good. And the, the, the takeaway, one of the major takeaways, this woman is absolutely amazing, is she said, I said how do you do this? So, well, the first thing I did is I took away all the options. Like how unnatural is it that you as a, as a nine-year-old kid, you walk into a cafeteria and you're expecting seven different options for lunch every day. We couldn't supply it and why should they expect it? So she offers two options. I think there's a, a, a meat option and, a, and maybe a vegetarian option or something and that's it. But yeah. she does it perfectly. Like she does a, an amazing job creating that food. And that is one of the things that allows her to create nourishing food for so many people at the same time. Yeah, it's like- Weston A. Price, I saw you're involved in, you know, it's nourishing food, nourishing traditions. And that's what, you know, we want to learn from that and how we kind of, when we do nutritional therapy practitioner certification course, you kind of, you start the first course we do is go through the history of food and the Potter experiment with, you know, feeding milk to cats, the cat experiment. The and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the Weston A. Price foundation, Weston A. Price himself, like what he discovered studying traditional communities and their teeth. And I think it's so important to look at, you know, what to go back to the roots. And I was saying in the intro for the show is that not just putting a name, a label on it, you know, it's just mm -hmm. eat real food like your ancestors did. So I guess kind of go in, what did our ancestral diet look like back in and, and where do you start from? And, <laughs> and how do you get people to understand that? Because they think, you know, where we went wrong industrialization when refined flour and sugar was developed and how you go before that to figure out what era was the ideal diet. And people always say too, I'll add on, then be quiet that, oh, well, they only lasted, you know, 30 years and then they died. So how is that a good diet? So that's what I always hear from people. Well, they had a short lifespan. So how's that working for them? You just brought up like 17 super important things. I'll try to, I'll try to touch on as many as I Sorry. can. That's first, what I do. Quick, just mind dump. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's great. Now, first, let me just say one thing real quick. Um, Weston A. Price and his work has had a tremendous influence on, on the way I view food and ancestral diets and the way I even um, view my own research has made such a great impact. And the Weston A. Price Foundation has done a fantastic job of spreading that message. I'd also like to point people to uh, the Price Pottinger Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which has, they have, um, you know, they have all Pottingers and Prices and a whole bunch of other people's uh, original work and notes and all that. And they're certainly worth looking into. They're a fantastic organization. Um, okay. So <laughs> it's, I talk in terms of millions of years and what's great about talking in terms of millions of years is it, it paints a really, I think, um, uh, lays a really good foundation for understanding our ancestral dietary past. The danger is in making, uh, is forget or, or getting rid of a bunch of diversity that is obviously there over, over millions of years. It wasn't like our caveman ancestors did this yeah. uh, because it's such a different amount of time in different places around the world. But one of the things I liked about the way Price did his work was he, what he noticed, one of the things he noticed is he went in different places. Everybody had different types of resources that they had access to, but they were fulfilling the same nutritional needs in through these different resources. Um, and, and there were a lot of similarities, like, um, you know, if there were grains, they were fermented. If there were, you know, if you're eating fat, it was almost exclusively animal fat, that's a, that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk in, in those kind of broad stroke terms, yeah. but, but realize that there's a lot of diversity I'm, I'm going to overlook. So to, to, to sort of just paint a real quick picture, um, I'm going to start it about five to 7 million years ago. And our ancestors at that time were super small. They stood about three and a half feet tall, full grown adults with brains about the size of my fist. And what's important there are two things. One is their nutritional needs are very, very low. They were small with small brains. Our brains today make up 2% of our body, but represent, they require 20% of the nutrition we take in to fuel. So they're massively uh, energy and nutritionally needed, needy organs. So as they grow, our nutrition skyrocket, nutritional needs skyrocket at the same time. Here we are, small brained, small bodied ancestors, completely wild, right? Just like any other wild animal, 
they're wild. And, and, for, and that means several things. One is every bit of food that they got, they got with what they had on their bodies. They had no technologies whatsoever. So whatever their eyesight was and their teeth and their jaw strength and their speed and their strength and or lack of it, their nails, that's what they had to access their food. And then what was inside of their body, again, their teeth, their digestive tract, whatever enzymes they produce, all those things, the size of their small intestines or large intestines, their stomach, whatever, that was all they had to actually get whatever, safely get the nutrition from that food that they ate. So they were very limited in what they could eat. They, they were eating, again, no technologies whatsoever. They were eating a limited amount of hyper-seasonal, hyper-local vegetables, fruits, and then as many insects as they could get. And the insects were the most nutrient-dense, bioavailable, and safest part of their diets. And that's what they're eating. About three and a half million years ago, they invented their first stone tools, which I actually, just because I was doing something earlier, I have one here. This is the a cast of the actual first stone tool ever invented 3.3 million years ago. Uh, it was created just west of Lake Turkana in Kenya at a place called Lamekwe. And this, when our ancestors created this tool, they went, <coughs> excuse me, from being gatherers to being scavenger gatherers. They could now access the meat left over on the African savanna. The predators would leave behind, cut pieces of it off, bring it back to camp, share it, and, and start eating meat. We also see bones at that time crushed open for marrow. So at three and a half million years ago, they introduced meat and a little bit of animal fat into their diets. The biggest change is at two million years when our ancestors created, uh, were able to control fire and created hunting technology. And this was huge because, so they started as gatherers, went to scavenger gatherers, and then now they're hunter gatherers for the first time. And the difference between scavenging and hunting, and I think it's an incredibly important one, is that when a predator makes a kill, the first thing that they eat are the, is the blood, the fat, and the organs. Mm -hmm. And then if they're still hungry, they go to meat, but typically they gorge themselves, they go off and sleep, leave this animal covered in meat for other animals to scavenge, and then maybe return for some meat later on. The meat is the afterthought in many cases. The most nutrient-dense, bioavailable, and safest part of an animal to consume are the blood, the fat, and the organs. And when we are hunters, we have first access to that animal that we've harvested. We can now, for the first time ever, start to eat those foods. And that is where the mass, I'm convinced, is where the massive influx of nutrition that helps support massive body and brain growth came from. And it is at that time period that we see the biggest jump in body and brain size. So hunting, access to the entire animal, and the ability to cook our food is uh, happening all around the same time that we get have our biggest evolutionary jump in body and brain size. All the technologies that we um, were creating at that time, we just got better at. Like every, so hunting technology, trapping technology, fishing technology, harvesting technology, fermentation, all of those things from that point forward for almost the entirety of 2 million years, we just got better at. And nutrition we were able to bring in and make accessible to our bodies just continued to skyrocket and support uh, evolutionary change, body change, body growth, brain growth, and up until, so then modern day Homo sapiens appear right now, we think about 300,000 years ago. So us, our species appears about 300,000 years ago. And then the next biggest change is at about 12,000 years ago when we invent uh, farming. And when we invent farming, everything changes. So, so far to recap, we started as gatherers. We invented stone tools and were scavenging and became scavenger gatherers. I, then we became hunter gatherers when all the amazing body changes and things were, you know, were going on for a long time. And then we became food producers. So when we start farming, we're producing food. A lot of changes happen with farming. One is that um, uh, we, we go from an incredibly diverse diet that has dozens of different animals and hundreds of different plants down to a, a, a diet's focused on one or two main crops. Like one or two main crops, they're almost always annual grasses. So there are rice in, in Eastern Asia, there are things like barley and wheat in the, mm -hmm. in the Fertile Crescent area, it's things like um, you know, maize in, in the Americas, and the diversity goes down, the nutritional quality goes down because we're focused on plants, the plant, the safety um, goes down as well because we're in flux of huge plant toxins and we see all sorts of issues with that. But one of the huge issues that um, we're really now seeing um, the negative effects from is that it's for the first time ever we've entered a new food system that separates certain members of society from where their food comes from and distances them. So, you know, everybody for millions of years was at some level involved directly with acquiring and processing food. And now we hit the agricultural revolution 
And we've, you know, some people are working massively hard to create a surplus, a storable surplus. And then other members of society are, we, you know, we learn about it in history class that they're freed up from the, from the gruel of trying to get their food. And, you know, we're creating poets and writers and politicians and all these things, which at some level is wonderful. But at another level, they're getting separated from one of the most important things that they need to be connected to is how to nourish themselves and their family. Mm-hmm. And the, the next and last biggest change I'd like to bring up happens in the 1700s with the Industrial Revolution, where we go from most of us being food producers to almost all of us just being food consumers, where there's a very small segment of society that's creating and processing massive quantities of food. Almost everybody's severely disconnected from where their food comes from, how it's processed, where it's going, all of that, and we just buy it. And that's the state that we're in now. And at every one of those last two levels, food becomes less nourishing, food becomes more dangerous, and we are losing this incredibly important connection to our food, and and we're really dealing with the, the after effects of that now. Because we're not making food from scratch and getting more food from the earth, and now we're doing it from a, a package. <laughs> Costco. We're doing it from a package, <laughs> and we don't even know the people that are doing it for us. Yeah, you know? Trader Joe's, Costco, the prepared foods. It, it's just convenience factor, and people have lost the ability to cook. And I'm not a chef. My husband Neil does all the cooking, but if I cook, it's so simple. It's like you know, take ground beef and mix it, cook it up. <laughs> there, I'm good, and mix it with avocado or something, or some eggs. And then I, I think people just go back to something you said earlier. Just keep it simple. And I think it's. People forget how cooking can be so easy and quick. It doesn't have to take an hour to make a meal. You can keep things on the simple side as I do, but remember, you know, simple, easy recipes to follow. And I think, you know, sure. people just forget how to eat and like for athletes get into real nutrition, but they'll, you know, for years we were taught, get a power bar and then get a cliff bar. And now it's, you know, eat this bar or that bar and just forget about the importance of being fit and healthy from the inside out by eating real nutrient dense foods and not getting all this packaged stuff that might be irritating your gut and causing more digestive dysfunction. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other, the other important piece, and yeah, you're right. Cooking can be simple and it, it should be the most powerful technologies, food related technologies that have transformed for millennia, raw ingredients and other safest, most nourishing forms for, for our human bodies are technologies and, and cooking techniques that our ancestors were doing in caves with sticks and clay pots and fire. So we're not talking about, you know, having to use a sous vide in your kitchen and buying, you know, all these other things and having a $20,000 kitchen makeover. That's not what I'm, or having to go to a, a culinary school to learn. These are very basic things that uh, we can, we could and actually need to do to our food. The other benefit that comes from cooking a little bit more at home, and, and, and whether it's just taking ground beef and cutting up, whatever it is, is that we learn about our food that way. I mean, we, you, you not only are you nourishing yourself, but you're nourishing your mind. You're learning about real food, how it's made. And it's one of the things I advocate all the time. One of our biggest missions here, um, I'm sitting here in the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is our nonprofit that's focused on um, research, teaching, and outreach. Uh, we hold a lot of classes here. We do a lot of in-person classes. We do a lot of online classes that are pre-recorded and, and live classes, and just teaching people the basics of making real food. Some of it's incredibly basic, like lacto-fermented vegetables and making sauerkraut. And like Some of it's a little bit more um, uh, complicated, a little bit but still very basic, like basic cheese making or basic mm-hmm. butchering or, or that sort of thing. Yeah. And when you realize how food is made for real, um, one of the biggest takeaways other than being able to nourish yourself is that you become the most incredibly informed consumer ever. You don't ever have to make cheese again. Take a cheese making class with us and then go to the grocery store, buy cheese the rest of your life, that's fine. Uh, go to that grocery, now that you go to that grocery store, you are you are immune to the advertising and the marketing and the product placement that's billions of dollars in the, in the food industry are, is putting on pretending that they're looking out for you. And all they're trying to do is sell you junk. You can see through all that, take a sour, whatever, whatever it is. And that is a really big uh, benefit of, of making, even if it's not all the time, but getting a little bit more into the kitchen and understanding how your food is made. Plain. All right. Plane going overhead. <laughs> That's the problem being close to these hills with helicopters flying by. So I think it's learning what is, you know, nutrient dense food that 
you know, is safe and help proper, proper digestion. Cause I know we talk a lot about, you know, not doing legumes and grains and plants unless mm-hmm. they're properly prepared and that you have, I know Ben Greenfield was just talking about this, like, you know, properly soak and sprout and, you know, have foods that you can have as a, a acute stressor, but not having it all the time. So when are, mm-hmm. I guess, like what foods are toxic and then the why, and because there's a fear of, you know, not having any vegetables and just doing carnivore and, you know, all plants are toxic to you. So talk a little bit about what foods should we eat and avoid, or do we just have to properly prepare them so we can digest them properly? The answer is yes, all the way around. So uh, <laughs> l- let me just start that off by painting a little bit of a picture. I think that that would help two, two, two pictures very quickly. One is if you look at, forget the agriculture revolution for a minute, everything before that, if you look at all the technologies that were created for millions of years surrounding food and, and almost every tech, every, almost every single human created technology for three and a half million years had something to do with food, right? Getting food, processing food, storing food, distributing food, cooking, whatever it is. Um, and so almost every Albert Einstein of our ancestral past was creating technologies surrounding doing something to make food more uh, safer and more nourishing, which I think is, is, is amazing. But if you look at all those technologies for millions of years and divide it into two different categories, animal-based technology, you know, technologies used to you know, put animals into our diets and technologies used to have plants in our diets, you see a, 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 there's a stark contrast between um, what they do. For the animals, it's all about getting the animal, right? It, it's creating te- almost all the technologies around animals are overcoming our physical limitations and allowing us to get the animal, you know, bows and arrows and atlatls and boomerangs and nets and traps and hooks, fishing hooks and these sort of thing to, to, to get the animal. Once you have that animal and it's in front of you, all you need is a sharp edge and you can get into that animal. And in almost every case, you're looking at the most nutrient dense bioavailable food humans have ever had sitting in front of you and you can just start eating. And it's incredibly safe. Plants are something different. Again, before the agriculture revolution, you needed digging sticks to dig into the ground and you might need nuts to, you know, rocks to crack open a nut. But for the most part, all the technologies created surrounding plants are to overcome two huge problems that plants have. One, that every plant on the planet is toxic at some level. So those technologies created to detoxify plants before we eat them. And secondly, even when plants have nutrition, quite often that nutrition is locked up in a way that is inaccessible to our incredibly inefficient digestive tract unless we do something to it first. So almost all the technologies around plants and including them in our diets are to make them safe and to actually get the nutrients into a state that their bodies can do something with. So that's number one. Number two, as far as a picture is concerned, yeah, every plant on the planet has some level of toxin. They have to, they have to protect themselves. They don't move. Sure, some plants have uh, physical protective mechanisms like shells on nuts or thorns on a rose bush or that sort of thing, bark on a tree. But for the most part, they're engaged in, in biological warfare, the outside world, chemical warfare. So we need to overcome those. We need to understand that's there and overcome those, those issues. Now, some of those toxins are fairly benign. Some of them will kill us right away. Most of them can cause harm in different quantities or it can build up in our bodies over time. Um, one quick, and it becomes very complicated. I'm sure people listening, oh my God, there's one more thing I got to worry about. And yes, yeah. it is something you should worry about. But here's a quick little, um, uh, maybe quick little kind of biology lesson that helps us understand where the the issues might really lie with plant toxins. So in general, if you think about a plant, the job of the plant, just like any species of any organism on the planet is to reproduce viable offspring. I mean, that's what any thing, any living thing has to do. And if they do that properly, then the species survives. And if there's a failure there, then at some level, the species um, you know, becomes extinct. So there's a lot of energy and a lot of effort put into, you know, plants put into themselves to make sure that that happens. And plants don't wanna get eaten for sure. Um, they don't wanna get a fungus. They don't wanna get a disease. They don't wanna have a predator attack them. They don't wanna do it. So they're trying to, to, to do all these things for the purpose of reproducing viable offspring. So when you look at a plant in general, Um, they create these allelochemicals, these these, uh, secondary compounds that either attract or deter other life. Now, with a flower, for example, flowers are rarely toxic. 
In fact, flowers look beautiful, smell beautiful, taste beautiful because they're, they're trying to attract things like mm -hmm. pollinators, for example, mm -hmm. it's part of the life cycle of the plant. So um, this is none of this is across the board, but in general, flowers are usually fairly low toxin. Fruits, same thing. Fruits are there to, the purpose of a fruit is to attract something, to eat it, a bird, a mammal, something to eat it, and then to help take the babies, the seeds, the seed. whatever, <laughs> to go somewhere else and poop it in a pile of manure and, and, and it works perfectly. That is when the seed is mature. Now there's a mm. lot of there's a lot of plants that the fruit has an issue with it. Uh, it either tastes bad or has a toxin um, until the seed is mature and then it changes and it tastes good and whatever. But in general, fruits aren't very toxic. Stalks and leaves can you know be, be either way. Um, but where I really want to put the emphasis on is the babies of the plant. The seeds, the nuts, the legumes, right? The grains, those are the babies of the plant. And there's a lot of effort put into keeping, you know, making sure that they stay as viable as possible to protect them until they're in the right environment to let their defenses down and sprout and support new life. So a good majority of plant toxins occur in the seeds, the nuts, the grains, the legumes. That doesn't mean we don't have the ability to make them safer. It just means that right away we need to recognize that there's a lot of biological effort, chemical effort getting put into protecting those seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. And so soaking, sprouting, fermenting all help a little bit with some of the toxins. So things like phytates and lectins, anti-nutrients, yeah. what have you, um, that works great. The problem is that um, none of those really do a good job with the oxalate. So um, the, the high oxalate containing plants are ones that you just need to be aware of that are there and either minimize them or exclude them from your diets. I think it's, I always go back to when I hear about this information and is listening to is Paul check that I learned it from first, but the four day rotation diet that don't eat the same foods every four days. And I think of that as, you know, these poisonous toxic plants that if it's acute stressor, if we have that once in a while, like once a week, you might have that, or, you know, once a month that you can be more resilient and fight that off instead of, if you have them every day, are they more potent? What do you think of that? Yeah, no, like those people that have kale and their sh shakes still every day and you know, all this spinach and all this stuff. I just hear Paul Saladino on his YouTube videos or Instagram screen, you know, his viewpoint well, on that. <laughs> you can hear, there's, hear there's, his voice when I say that. <laughs> there's points to some of that. And here's one of the issues. We've created a lot of the problems that we're now trying to, to fix and mitigate. They weren't necessarily, some of these things weren't problems in the past. You know, we've taken something, a plant like spinach, and I, and I think about when I think about spinach, I always think about Sally Norton, who does a much better job at this yeah, than I do. That's right. But, you know, she talks about how, you know, for some reason, we listen to a cartoon character tell us that spinach oh. was healthy, right? <laughs> Popeye. And Popeye. then we've taken it, <laughs> elevated this incredibly dangerous plant to this, this superfood level and <laughs> have this mindset that some of it is good, more of it is better. I'm going to eat as much as I can. Yeah, um, look like Popeye. And, yeah, exactly. And we've also, because of the modern food system, made a plant that was in the past, even when you had it, was available in your backyard, in your garden for like two weeks out of the year. We've now, you know, elevated to a superfood level, made it available 365 days of the year because we're shipping it all over the world and putting it in greenhouses and, you know, tunnels and all this. We have it frozen. And then, um, and we've made it incredibly financially accessible. So all these limiting factors we would have had in the past, like we only could have, first of all, spinach is a domesticated plant, but you know, the wild version of it, we only had access to for a couple of weeks of the year. Um, and then when we did start to domesticate it and grow it, we only had access to it for a couple, you know, weeks out of the year. And then when we started shipping and all that, it was incredibly expensive, at a, you know, so it was a limiting financial mechanism. Now we've taken right down all those barriers and I know people who are actually eating spinach twice a day. It's in the shake in the morning and it's in spinach at lunch. And they're getting this huge influx of oxalates. Just as a quick side note, one bowl of spinach is like four or five times the recommended amount of oxalates you should get on a daily basis. Wow. And that's a bowl of spinach, which is, you know, fresh spinach, which is mostly air. Anyhow, mm -hmm. right? So when you start concentrating it and cooking it down and, and freezing it and putting it in your smoothie, you're creating an incredibly dangerous situation. So, so those limiting factors, those limiting mechanisms are not there. It's kind of like nuts. If I said to you, like, 
go get, go to, here are two rocks, go to the almond tree and collect a bunch of almonds and, and eat the almonds. You're going to go out there. First, what most people don't realize is that the nuts are surrounded by a shell and then they're surrounded um, by a hole. Yeah. So first you get the hole off, then you have the shells. You got to collect them. You got to get the hole off. Then you got to crack open the shell. Then you got to pick the nut meats out. At the end of the day, you got a handful of nuts. But now we can go to Costco and buy a bag of a almonds you know, for 10 bucks <laughs> and you're eating handfuls of them all the time. And then we've sort of elevated almonds and almond meal and all this on keto diets and all this. So now we're getting into, and we've created a problem that wasn't there before because there were so many limiting mechanisms. And that's what happens when we get disconnected from our food, how to process it, how to get it. And we have these huge issues. I was trying to make, I have a list of people want to email me. I can send it to them, but I was trying to make a spreadsheet. What are oxalate foods, lectins, phytates, FODMAPs? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> okay, what's left is eating what, you know, Sean Baker and what you're kind of more of a, a I don't know if you call it carnivore or just say like proper human diets, Dr. Ken Berry, or your eat like a human. It's, it's eating foods that are more animal based and you take out all these irritants and you, what do you end up with? <laughs> it's just the animal <laughs> protein. It's like, all right. Cause I couldn't never, I never can remember. Okay. Which ones are phytates, oxalates, lectins, you know, they're just a huge list. And so you really realize how a lot of vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes are irritants to our gut and cause a lot of dysfunction. And we can test this. If people want to know organic mm -hmm. acids tests, they use great plains oats test, and it can tell you your oxalate levels and find out more if you are having some inflammation in your body from certain foods. And also I like vibrant wellness wheat well, not weed zoomer, but they do a whole, they have a lectin panel on vibrant wellness when we do the zoomers and it's like 400 something dollars for four panels of the zoomers. But it's, if you don't believe what you're eating is impacting, whoop, I just pushed myself. If you don't believe what you're eating is impacting your gut health and the rest of your body that you really should uh, look into testing and, and, and seeing what's actually going on in the inside out. If you can't, I think it's easier. Sometimes people make these big, huge changes and they realize mm -hmm. what's actually happening inside. Cause they don't know. It's like, what? Well, hey, sure. there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. And they lose that intuitive connection to how they actually feel and how that spinach twice a day is making them feel. They don't really know anymore. Cause I think that we've lost touch with how do I feel? What does my body want? Cause now for myself that I realize, like, I don't really feel like that. My body craves more protein and I feel better eating more protein. I'm not going to put a label on it, but some days maybe I'll have a cabbage salad or something, but you know, the old me, I would just think vegetables all the time. And now it's, mm -hmm. I switched to more eating more protein and it's just amazing how much better I feel, but just my body, I, I don't you know, I listen to what I feel like. I'm like, yeah, I don't feel like eating that today. So I think that's a part of the process too, is learning, listening to what your body needs. Oh, 100%. <laughs> and, and, and creating that baseline to know, I mean, so many people that I don't, unfortunately, I don't think have eaten a 100% incredibly safe nourishing meal, or at least not done that over enough meals and days or weeks to know what their baseline, this is what feeling really, really good feels like. And now, you know, what my, know. What my norm was, is shouldn't be my norm, right? It's this, but here, here are two, I think really easy to think about tricks, not tricks, um, ways to think about eating plants and animals um, that if you just do this as a first step and don't, you don't necessarily overthink it. If you don't have, a, I a hundred percent agree. If I had, if I got, I wish I had access to, um, uh, you know, oxalate level testing and those sorts of things before. Um, so those are all fantastic. One of the, if you do these two things immediately um, and change your uh, point of view about food and consuming it and those sorts of, you know, uh, this I think will make, these two things will make a very big difference. Number one, as far as plants are concerned, if the only thing you did as a first step is eat as hyper local and hyper seasonal as possible, you would take away a lot of the issues that we've caused in the modern food industry. So again, all of a sudden, even if you're eating spinach, you're eating it only two weeks out of the year when it's when it's actually available where you live, grown on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, it, you know, you're taking out a whole bunch of nuts. You're taking out all these things, and if you are eating them, you're processing them from the from the rawest form possible. You're limiting the amount that you're taking in at any given time. So by default, you're going to um, not be having an influx of you know spinach twice a day for 365 days out of the year, you know that sort of thing. So th that is a first step. 
because diving down this rabbit hole of things like oxalates and plant toxins is incredibly exhausting and mind numbing and, and mind blowing. Um, and while you're taking that journey, um, at least do that as a first step. I think that's a great first step. As far as animals are concerned, we can almost say the same thing with animals. There's been, the, I, I am a, a strong advocate of complete nose to tail eating with animals. I, I, that I, I believe is what helped create us as humans, help fuel our body and brain growth. I think it's the most ethical and sustainable and nourishing way to go about including animals in our diet. But the pendulum in some camps has swung a little bit too far. I mean, now we, you know, instead of just advocating, we just eat meat. Now we have people advocating eating like 10 pounds of liver a day and, and all these other sorts of things. And I get asked all the time, okay, how much liver should I actually eat, right? That's a question that is a brand new question we never had in the past, right? We've created an issue, a situation where we can even ask that question. Because right now, if I, if I made the case that liver, and I do believe liver is one of the most nutrient-dense foods and most bioavailable foods on the planet, you know, many people who are of that mindset, some is good, more is better, would then say, okay, great, I'm going to Whole Foods and you're going to buy 20 pounds of chicken liver in, you know, one quart containers. And you can, for the first time ever, you can go and buy livers without having to buy the chicken or having to buy the pig. Um, in the past, this wasn't a question. You know, how much liver did I eat? Well, how much, how much livers in that animal you just killed and how much spleen is there and how much our kidneys are there and the heart and all the meat and the marrow and the fat and all that. And then you go ahead and, and, and kill the next animal. Now we're in a situation where somebody else is raising the animal, somebody else is killing it, somebody else is butchering it, somebody's packaging it, it's getting shipped onto the shelves and you as the consumer can walk in and now you're faced with this dilemma. What do I buy? How much of it do I buy? How much am I supposed to consume this week? And a great answer, you know, a great way to approach animals, I truly believe, some people are gonna balk at this, is bring the biggest piece of that animal possible into your kitchen. Don't go buy chicken breast anymore, go buy a chicken. Like go buy, you're worried about the prices of organic pasture chickens, go buy the whole chicken and you have three meals instead of just one. And all of a sudden that price changes a little bit, but you also get the liver and you also get the heart and you also get the gizzard that you can do things with and the bones to make bone broth from and all those sorts of things. Bring in a half a pig. I know it sounds silly. We've been bringing in half a pigs into our kitchen for 10 years. And I'm tell, I can get a half a, of a local pig for $140. And it can feed my family for a great amount of time. But on top of that, my kids see something on the counter that looks like an animal. It doesn't look like a pack of chicken breast. It actually still looks like a pig. And they see skin and they see bones and they see a little bit of blood. They see the fat. It, it is all hell about creating that connection. But at the same time, you see how big the liver is, right? And, and you eat that liver and you eat the rest of that pig. And then you go ahead and get another pig and get the liver and get the spleen. So eating uh, as, uh, as locally and seasonally as possible the vegetables and bringing in the biggest part of an animal as possible. And if you aren't going to bring in that into your kitchen, at least have that mindset when you're at the butcher shop or you're at that part of the grocery store and you're not just buying T-bone steaks because you're trying to eat ancestrally, you're buying as much of that animal as possible in that same kind of proportion. And even if you're close, you're doing a lot better than you probably did, you know, any, any other part of your life. So, uh, I'm kind of making me nauseous, <laughs> <laughs> but I understand that benefit of the, the nose to tail, but it is, I, to be honest, it grosses me out. <laughs> so I do Does it really? Old. Oh yeah. I just started eating red meat a couple of years ago. Cause I was hanging out with everyone at KetoCon and the conferences and I just stopped, uh, I blame it on Kentucky fried chicken when I was about 12 years old that I was eating drumstick going, Ooh, there's black veiny things on here and we're eating this. And <laughs> I stopped eating until like age 48. I eat chicken cause it wasn't chicken. And I started eating bacon, but anyways, uh, it's hard to, you know, when you're trained, you have to look at it differently and look at how you're nourishing, nourishing traditions as Weston A. Price Foundation is about. And Sally Fallon, that is eating that real food. That's going to give me all those nutrients. And that's why I've chosen to, you know, take off the label and have my organ capsules. Cause I know it's so good. Cause all the vitamins I've been deficient in mm -hmm. is why I started eating more red meat is, you know, in the real food sources. And I, I hate taking supplements, even though I take a bunch of different things, but ideally we should just get all our nutrition from food. And that's where I always read where, okay, this is where I'm low in this your bees is zinc, CoQ10 and glutathione, you know, where is everything in the organ meat? So I understand the importance of it. If you can choose real food sources, I think we don't often digest 
And those are supplements we take. Everyone takes all this stuff. And I don't even think it breaks down in your body. I think it's like 20% <laughs> you might get from it. So the real food is obviously the way to go. All right. So I might, I might've gone a little bit on the deep end. I understand <laughs> it. I, I, I am. I let, let me just say this because it's there's some right. people here like you that are, that, that might say, Oh my gosh, this is making me nauseous and grossing me out. There's some people <laughs> that are like, maybe there's something here, but I'm not ready to take that step. I, I understand that my wife was a vegetarian for most of her life. Um, or more, at least up in, uh, until a few years after we got married, I didn't force her. She did it completely on her own. She started craving meat when she was pregnant, but um, when she went through a very long journey as well as is continuing on it, her in, introducing meat into her diet again was a hamburger and chicken breast for a very long time. And I thought of like liver or spleen or kidney was like incredibly repulsive, but now it's not. And now, you know, it, it, we're all on this journey. So for those of you who kind of listen to what I just said and are like, Oh, not now. <laughs> like Debbie. Okay. Not now. Keep it in the back of your mind yeah. for later. But let me just say this. If you're going to start introducing organ meats into your diet in the, in the whole form, not, not just the capsule form. Um, I have a couple recommendations. The first recommendation is start with heart. Heart is essentially a muscle. So it's got the same flavor profile. It has very similar texture to what you're used to with meat. Um, it essentially is meat, but it's got a whole lot more nutrition in it too. So it's a very good kind of gateway drug for, for organ meats. The other one is start with chicken liver. I have in my book, um, a really good chicken liver pate recipe uh, that we developed that's super simple to make. We, we, we sell it here at the Modern Science Kitchen. We make it at home all the time. The kids absolutely love it. It's very easy to make. Um, mm. It tastes really, really good. It doesn't have um, a lot of people with organ meats. Sometimes it's a little bit of the flavor, but for a lot of people, it's the texture that um, is, is difficult. And when you take something like liver and turn it into a pate, especially this kind of pate, it's smooth. It's like butter. You know, a lot of that texture issues are, are, are gone. And it, I, I eat it several times a week. It's, it's really, really good. So mm -hmm. instead of maybe slapping a pig, slapping a pig on your counter, start with that. Um, <laughs> those, those are some good places to start. Yeah. Just slicing open a heart on my counter and just putting it between a steak. <laughs> well, Not, you can cook it. Well, yeah. You know, th that's another good point. I know there's some people doing this too. Take, um, it, the other thing you can do is, is certainly grind uh, the organ meats in I've heard that. with beef. And, uh, you know, a lot of people listening probably don't have a meat grinder in their kitchen. Uh, so the two suggestions, one is if you're going to start grinding any meats or organs or anything at all, KitchenAid has a fantastic attachment that works and, and that's fantastic. But the other thing is a lot of butchers, if you have a butcher in your area, um, a lot of butchers will custom grind for you. So you could say to them, Hey, you know, I want burger meat, but please throw in, you know, 10% liver, 5% something else and, and, and do it. And, and a lot of times they will, they'll do it for you. Yeah. I bet we have Jimbo's a natural grocery store here in North San Diego and lazy acres. And I'm sure they do that. Cause I know they sell a lot of the good quality organ meats that I see at the conferences is so I think it's, you know, tying this to the endurance athlete to finish up our show today, but the importance of athletes to work on improving performance in life and sports and longevity that we need to really turn to a real food nutrient dense diet as an athlete. Cause I think a lot of people exercise I've you know, coached people for 25 years that a lot of people start training for a marathon or triathlon and they gain weight because <laughs> they think, Oh, I, I just did this bike ride or two, three hour run. I can eat whatever I want. And I learned that years ago with clients, I'm like, how are you gaining weight? We're doing all this training because <laughs> mentally people think they exercise, they can eat more crap, <laughs> not eat more real food. So how would you suggest like for an athlete to switch to the, the benefits they get from, obviously we get the proper nutrition to help recovery and repair, improve sleep, improve muscle senses and any of that. So a couple of things, I, you know, when I was an athlete in high school and especially in college, um, you know, the program that I was in was fantastic and, and they hired nutritionists for us. We had team doctors and all those sorts of things um, giving us as everybody was across the country at the time, giving incredibly poor advice. Um, you know, we were on these very high carbohydrate diets, uh, trying to lose weight, high carbohydrate diet. It, it was terrible. We would go to, to pasta night uh, once a week as a team. You know, it was all white pasta. Um, there was a mindset that we had. We were listening to the people in charge. We were listening to the people, the PhDs, and, you know, had, had the credentials. And I remember thinking to my, you know, forcing myself to think this is supposed to make me healthy. 
And when I would eat something else that wasn't part of that plan, like at the time, animal fat was demonized. And if I had um, a steak and I had a bit of animal fat or if I had a piece of bacon, I felt nauseous. I felt bad. I felt like I, I actually felt like I had put on weight. Like I felt, and it, it was completely mental, right? It, it was a mental thing because my baseline was not actually how I felt. My baseline was how I was told I was supposed to feel and how you know, this diet was supposed to be good. And I, now I'm a, now that I'm in touch with my body in tune with my body in touch with my food more than I've ever been, I know, I truly know what it feels like to be nourished it's completely reversed on its head. And those same feelings I had when I, I thought I had when I ate bacon, or I thought I had when I had a piece of you know fat with my steak um, are now exactly how I feel when I say white flour, unprocessed white flour or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, number one, the one thing I can, can say is do everything you can to fully connect with your food and do everything you can to have truly nourishing meals to create that baseline. When you create that baseline, you are the biggest advocate for your own health. You are the biggest advocate for your own uh, you know, athletic performance. You should have that baseline to be able to go from that. The second thing I would say is, and I say this all the time, is food is here to nourish us. Food for humans is a really weird thing. Our relationship is strange. It's, you know, true nourishment is more than just biological nourishment. It's emotional nourishment. It's cultural nourishment. It's, you know, making sure it fits within whatever our, 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 um, our uh, ideas about, you know, religion and, and culture and tradition and all those things are. So it has to, you know, sort of check all these boxes to be truly nourishing for us. But at, at what we should strive for is whether we're having a snack in the car or a meal at a table or at a restaurant or a cafe, wherever we are, the goal should be that when you get up from that table, you feel better than when you sat down at that table. I mean, the food is supposed to nourish us and you should feel better biologically. Your gut should feel better. You should feel satiated and full, but not overly full like you do at Thanksgiving. You should feel emotionally and culturally better. And it, it should tick all the boxes for your ideas about ethical perspectives and, and, and sustainability, all those things. That's the goal. That should be the goal from every meal that you have. So I know there's a sort of pie in the sky thing not directed necessarily towards athletes, but I, uh, but let me just say something from an ancestral perspective um, to, 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 to bring this back around because your audience is so focused um, on athletic performance and endurance and, and the like. One, I'm sure many, you and probably many people listening have, have heard of maybe the carrier hypothesis where there's this persistence hunting um, that, uh, you know, that our ancestors at some level were, were, were doing and, and some people still do today, rarely, but they do. And it's persistence hunting. You know, humans are endurance athletes by design. I mean, we are. We are upright for a certain reason. Our hips and our, our, our spinal arrangement is, is, is where it's, we, sh we are meant to run and we are meant to run long distances. Everything about our anatomy is focused on this, including the way that we regulate temperature, um, in, in our bodies. So it turns out that in this carrier hypothesis is this idea that humans are over a long distance, the fastest animals on the planet, and that we can not run any animal. Um, and we can, if we can, if the conditions are perfect and the, um, you know, it's super hot, it's super dry. Um, and we can track animals. We can, uh, chase animals down to the death. Now this takes 20, 25 miles. You're literally running a marathon distance in order to do this and it requires tracking and, and several people doing it. Um, but we are biologically designed to be able to do this. Now, other animals are not. We are. And when you look at people who are still engaged in this, um, they're able to, you know, they're living lives and they're eating diets very different than most of us are today. Um, the, the people engaged in this are eating high protein, high fat, low carbohydrate diets. And, 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 it's, and it's amazing. And what's also interesting around the world, I've done a lot of work with indigenous and traditional groups around the world. At, at some level, almost everybody, every group that I've spent time with practices, and they don't call it this, and they're not doing it intentionally. It just makes sense practicing some level of intermittent fasting or at least a, a shortened eating window. And what it usually looks like is this, and it doesn't matter if they're hunter gatherers, it doesn't matter if they're farmers or pastoralists, what typically happens, and still today in a lot of these places, everybody gets up in the morning and goes and does whatever they do, whether they're farming or hunting or taking care of the ant, whatever they're doing, they get up and go and do it. 
And then somewhere in the early afternoon or so, everybody comes back and usually eats a little bit of whatever was the meal the night before, some of the leftovers. And then people go out and continue to do their thing. During the day, somebody or a group of people have, have stayed back at, you know, in, in, in the village or wherever they are to prepare the evening meal, which is the biggest meal of the day. Then when all the work is done, it's starting to get dark, everybody comes in, they sit down together, they visit, they tell stories, and they eat the largest meal of the day. Then the, the visiting continues for a while, then everybody goes to bed and they get up and do the same thing again. It makes sense for the way that they spend their day. It makes sense um, you know, on, on a regular basis. This is, this is what I've seen over and over again. So if, if you want to take uh, a little bit of a, an anthropological and ancestral perspective on some of this, how humans have dealt with this. Now, again, it isn't 100% across the board. I am 100% convinced that an animal base, now this doesn't mean that plants aren't a part of their diets. You know, plants can very, some plants processed the right way can still be a very, uh, can be, a, I'm convinced, a, a healthy part of a human diet. But the most safest, most bioavailable nutrient dense foods on the planet come from animals. They should make up the majority of, of, of the diets and some level of not eating all day long. You know, I was brought up six, seven, eight meals a day or what we're supposed to be striving for. Some level of um, shortened eating windows um, and intermittent fasting, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, I see over and over again. And I think those are huge takeaways. And that's what is the focus of the way that I eat and the way we feed our family. And I think they're all very important. So... I think that's, it's so important to share that because I think it's great information and to apply it to the endurance athletes, figuring out, you know, what to eat. And because I've been trying to match nutrition, their fueling with your training, it depends on the workout. So if you're doing a fasted morning workout, for example, it should be low intensity. Like you're saying ancestral health, they would go out and, you know, walk. They were not, they're doing easy, low heart rate exercise. They were not w or waking up and doing sprints or something. They're probably were taking it easy. And that, you know, when we should eat before we work out and eat afterwards, it gets, you know, I guess complicated or and it's very individualized depending on the type of workout and your stress in your life. But what are some examples is my point of what to eat if we're trying to eat like a human and we are exercising and say like you're doing a morning workout and a noon workout for people doing like triathlon training, that's easy to digest. Cause I know some people are doing steak and eggs, like Bronson Dapp, my friend does, you know, he's eating all these eggs and steak. I'm like, I can't eat that. And then go for a swim. <laughs> I'd be throwing up in the pool. So it's just, I think for nutrition information to eat like a human you need the proper human diet for an athlete when you are exercising more than once a day is complicated for people to eat real food, nutrient dense, that's easy to digest. So suggestions in that area of the that's, chef you, you, you have you, become? You're not gonna like my answers. <laughs> eat a pile of liver, start liver gel. Meats. Um, if, if you, um, I am, my specialty is not in, in feeding and nourishing endurance athletes. So I don't want to speak directly to that yeah. and, and misspeak, but I'll, I'll tell you from where, where my perspective is, uh, you know, whatever you guys can take this for what it's worth. Um, if, if we're looking at food from a digestive standpoint, what can we, what can we, how can we get nutrition without our bodies working too very hard to get it? There's a couple of, uh, of takeaways. Number one, like I mentioned earlier, the most nutrient dense bioavailable, in other words, your body can access it without working very hard at all. Food on the planet is awful. It's blood, fat, and organs. Uh, we, in Danny, fact, Vega. Da Danny yeah. Vega talked about the whole breakdown of that a couple of years ago on our low carb cruise. It's like awful. There's reason for the name awful, but yes, that has the most nutrient density. It, it is. Right? It, it's the most nutrient dense and your body doesn't work very hard to access those nutrients. Okay. Again, don't listen to this and say, okay, well, some of it's good. And I have to eat 10 pounds of liver today. Yeah. It's not the way that it works, but Why is that um, better? So, some is good. And some is so good that it packs a powerful punch. Some is enough. Yeah. Um, meat, as far as meat is concerned, and again, my, my focus is on the, um, what we do to food to make it as safe and nourishing as possible. So I think maybe there's some good takeaways here. Um, red meat has been on our diet for three and a half million years. Um, but 
red meat by itself, big chunks of red meat, despite what you hear in other places, is um, is great and is incredibly nourishing. But in a in a chunky raw state, is not as bioavailable as it can be. Right? There's a couple of things we can do to red meat to make our bodies access the nutrients in it with less work. Number one, it's to physically break it down. So ground meat or sliced meat already a lot of, I mean, just, just think about the difference between what your teeth and your guts have to do to mm-hmm. access those nutrients between eating up, like throwing a huge hunk of red, raw red meat yeah. into your mouth or, or, or hamburger yeah. meat. And if you go to a really nice restaurant, like a really nice normal level restaurant and you get raw red meat, you get it as either tartare, which is ground meat, or you get it as carpaccio, which is sliced paper thin. So that, that, and that's why they do it. The second thing is is, is a, a wonderful, uh, amazing primatologist from Harvard by the name of Richard Wrangham, who's done a lot of work with uh, the role of cooking in our dietary past. And one of the things that he found is that a little bit, a little bit of cooking of red meat helps make the nutrients more available to the human body. Um, o- overcooking goes the opposite way, but a tiny bit of cooking. So truly, in my mind, like a like the most bioavailable form of eating red meat is like a medium rare hamburger. I mean, you've mechanically broken it down through grinding and you've done yeah. a little bit of cooking and you made, so uh, a little bit of cooking, a little bit of mechanical breakdown helps with, with the meat. Secondly, as far as vegetables are concerned, if we are trying to access the nutrients in vegetables, we really need to do something to them. Sometimes it's cooking, sometimes it's chopping. A lot of times it's fermentation. I mean, you mentioned cabbage earlier. Cabbage and sauerkraut are two completely different foods. And the difference is not in how, what the work that you did. The difference is in the trillions of, of bacteria that have, go, that have done the fermentation for you. So um, fermentation. So if you're going to eat vegetables and, and want to expect uh, getting nutrients out of them without your body working too hard, think about things like fermentation. And the final things I would, thing I would say is um, for those of you who do consume dairy, um, the by far the most nutrient dense, bioavailable nourishing form of dairy is not only raw, but it's fermented dairy. Mm. Um, I've spent, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of time with indigenous groups all over the world, except for in one instance, um, do any of them take milk and pour it into a glass and drink it? I mean, that, that no, nobody does that. Like we, we haven't done that. I mean, we've been consuming dairy from other animals as a species for like 8,000 years. We don't drink milk. And we certainly don't pour it on cereal. That's a, that's a mo- those are both modern, modern things. Yeah. Take the milk and ferment it and turn it into kefir or turn it into yogurt or turn it into a traditional cheese. And those foods are not only tastier, but they are by default more nutrient dense. They have a lower lactose load because the lactose is the food for the lactobacillus bacteria. Sometimes they're lactose free, but they're also chemically and physically pre-digested so that our bodies can access the nutrients in that dairy uh, more readily. I, I know that firsthand in my own body because my motility is slow. And especially when I had, I didn't eat red meat for a majority of my life that I, when I started eating red meat, I was TMI, but I say whatever I think here on the show, <laughs> I was throwing up <laughs> like every time I'd eat red meat, I'd add steak, or I tried prime rib my first time a couple of Christmases ago. I was so sick. And I think it's, you know, your body being able to digest a food and be able to have those digest enzymes. And as we get older, you, often people are lower digest enzymes. So ancestral, does that like eating real food and and fermenting the foods and cooking it the right way? Do you think that decreases our need to supplement with the digest enzymes and HCL as we get older? Because so many people have a hard time digesting foods properly. Oh, 100%. There's there's no doubt in my mind. And again, I don't want to speak too far outside of my lane, but the, um, what I'm talking about here with the, the fermentation and the chemical and physical breakdown of things and, and all that, none of that is new. Like it's yeah. new to not do those things. So our digestive tracts have been co-evolving with our changing diets for millions of years, and they are designed to do certain things or set up to do it. And there's a lot of parts of the digestive process that they've never had to do because we have literally always been doing it before we put it into our bodies. Mm -hmm. And example, like fermenting dairy is is a fantastic example. So a lot of the issues we have with digesting food is certainly of of, of a modern, um, you know, modern making, including things like antibiotics and, and, and that sort of thing. But it's also because we're putting food into our bodies now that 
we, we think is ancestral at some level and the food itself might be, but we're putting it into our bodies in a new way that it hasn't been put into our bodies before, like ultra pasteurized skim milk. We've been consuming dairy for a very long time from other animals, but nothing like ultra pasteurized skim milk, which has nothing going for it nutritionally, but also it's already because of the pasteurization process and uh, for a couple other reasons, any part of that food that would have aided in its own digestion is now dead or gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I 100% I agree that that, that proper processing is, is going to help all of our digestive processes for sure. Yeah, and not have to have lactose pills and all that sure. and take probiotics because we're getting it from our food, fermented foods. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is the best way to get it. Good. So I know out of time, but you have a lot going on this next year and your cheese making classes. I need to send Neil over there. So where are you located? <laughs> Tell everyone where to find you and what events you have coming up. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, number one, a lot of the information we talked about today, uh, I dive into much deeper in my book, Eat Like a Human, which you can get um, obviously at any you know, major bookstore online. You can get it if you want it from us. Um, you can go online and get it from us and I'd be happy to sign it and send it off to you. And um, it's also on uh, digital and, and audio as well. Um, as far as the other things we have going on, we're located on the eastern shore of Maryland in Chestertown, which isn't, it, it's off the beaten path, but it's not very far from New York City or Philadelphia or Baltimore or Washington, D.C. So if you're ever in the area, please come see us. We have two um, entities here. One is the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, where everything we talked about here, everything we have in the book, um, we put into practice to help nourish the community. And we're producing food out of it, food to take away and food to sit down and eat. Um, so we have that. And you can find out more information about the Modern Stone Age Kitchen at modernstoneagekitchen.com and follow uh, on social media at Modern Stone Age Kitchen. And then we also have a nonprofit called the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which I mentioned earlier, which is where all the teaching and the outreach and the education comes from. And we have a beautiful newly renovated teaching kitchen here. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a lot of online resources like classes and, 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 and events. And you can find out more about that at eatlikeahuman.com. So whether or not you're in the area or you're further away, you can access a lot of our information and what we have to offer um, through electronically. You can follow me and, and more that we do there at the Eastern Shore Food Lab at, at Dr. Bill Schindler. So Dr. Bill Schindler on Instagram and, and, and Facebook and the like. And please, if you're interested in anything that I talked about, um, go to one of those websites and sign up for our newsletter. We send out an email every Monday with a whole bunch of information, including events coming up. So you mentioned Bronson. Um, Bronson and Natalie and me and Christina are putting together a, a meetup for um, uh, November 5th, we're going to have here at the, well, at the Modern Stone Age Kitchen. Oh, I'll awesome. Well, we'll make sure we do. You should come out. Um, actually, a couple people from California are coming out. And we're going to have um, uh, Sally Norton speaking. Um, we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, we're at Dr. Gary Schliffer's coming out from L.A. Uh, we're going to have um, Stephen Hussey's coming up and, uh, you know, Bronson and Natalie and me. And we're going to have a huge panel together. And, uh, and have some incredible food. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to, uh, to get together. And we have themed meals and all kinds of educational experiences. So if you sign up for our newsletter, uh, we'll send out information every Monday. See, we need to do that here. I'm hosting a meet up at our house, September 10th, 2022, as we record this. And uh, so many people didn't get what I was talking about. Meet up, what? You're going to come naked and show your muscles off? I'm like, no, everyone in... <laughs> Texas style meetup, you know, this is what people do. So we're having one September 10th here and I've got great sponsors giving out some samples for everyone, the podcast people that live around here. But I think, you know, it'd be a great idea. We have a good kitchen that just was remodeled. We moved in two years ago. We've got this acre property up here for entertaining. So if you want to do a, a San Diego All right. meetup That's in the future your cooking class, sure. you can come stay in our guest room and you guys can uh, do all your classes here. We've got a good awesome. spot. So all the California people can join in, but thank you so much. Great information. And everyone should get your book and get some cooking classes if you're over there. Cause I think it's learning how to cook food and, and meal prep in advance. So things are available to you. So you don't go to that packaged food, processed food and quick to go cliff bars and all that stuff. So hopefully people can learn again, how to eat real food and eat like a human. <laughs> awesome. It was great to talk to you. Thank you so much.